FB. Before we start this video, a large thank you to Logan, Azak, and Thundy4000 for their support on Patreon. I hope you guys enjoy the video. And an immense thank you to Halo Burner and Sora Stratos for their immense support to the channel this month on Patreon. I hope you guys enjoy the video. Hello everybody, if we open up our animator right now and we go to our attack animations, we're actually going to position the points where we're going to open up the damage colliders. So you can see this is a swing and it's utilizing here the left and right arms. So this is going to be different depending on what kind of character you're working with. But because I'm working with an undead, I'm going to set this up for some unarmed undead attacks. So go to your character and we're going to do this in a very simple manner. We're going to go now and go to where you want to put the damage collider. And this assumes your character is not switching weapons. We'll handle more advanced AI in the future that behave kind of like invaders or players. But for your basic AI, go to where you want to set up your damage colliders. Um, I say colliders because there might be more than one. Like in my case, I'm using two. Could be even three or four. And now let's go over to the melee weapon damage collider and take a look at this script. Now we could utilize the damage target function here and change it a bit, which we're probably going to do. So let's go back into the project. And let's go and find a game object to place a damage collider. And I'm going to call mine Undead Hand Damage Collider. Now, the reason why I'm giving it its own damage collider is because a lot of AI might have their own features or special needs for these damage colliders. Not necessarily. You could totally use the melee damage collider if you want to. But I'm going to give every enemy its own damage collider types uh, just so it stays kind of separate and clean. So I'm going to just set the radius a little bit wider here than the size of the hand so it's not... Um, too brutal and I'm just going to make it extend a little bit past the fingertips I'm going to do the same thing I'm going to put it by the way on the finger game object not on the same game object that we have another collider for our character on our uh, our attackable collider we want to give it its own game object without any other collider so we can set the layer to damage collider and not damageable character so once that's done add the colliders the sphere colliders make sure you tick is trigger you can use a sphere collider or a, or a box collider whatever you can use make sure it is a trigger now let's open up the Undead Hand Damage Collider script, or whatever you have, you be using a, a, a person with a sword or a weapon. Whatever Damage Collider script you've chosen to use, open that up. I'm going to make it derive from Damage Collider, the base class, so we get all the functionality. And I'm going to go over now and just open that up, actually, and take a peek at that, because maybe we'll copy some logic from here instead. So the on-trigger enter is going to stay the same, uh, identically, actually, because in the future when we have blocking and we're checking for invulnerability, we're going to come back and just call the base trigger. So on the melee weapon damage collider, let's actually copy the damage target function and let's paste that inside our undead damage collider. And again, if you want to use the undead animations, they're available on our asset store page. And if you're using your own animations, uh, the same thing will still apply here. Even if you're using like a straight sword attack or a mace attack, the logic will still be the same. So let's make a variable here now for our AI character. So I'm just going to make a variable of type AI character manager. I'm going to call that AI character. And you can call it AI character causing damage if you prefer to keep the naming conventions the same because um, on the melee weapon damage collider script, that's what we refer to. But I am just going to keep it as uh, AI character. Actually, I'm going to call it undead character. I'll change that in a moment. So come out here and replace all the character causing damages with uh, our new variable. In my case, it's going to be called undead character. And now there are a couple ways to go about this. Um, so when you damage a target, Basically, right now, it's it's checking that if the the zombie or the undead on the host side hits you, regardless of if it hits you on your screen, it's going to damage you. It's going to send a server RPC. So this is fine in most cases, but sometimes you'll have it where the AI will look a little bit further away from you if you're a client, and then it won't appear to hit you. So option two, which is what I'm going to use here, is we're going to check to see if the damage target is the owner, and if on their screen it hits them, then basically they will apply the damage regardless of where it is on the host screen. So there's pros and cons of both of these, but for the general experience, I'm going to use option two. So now the lock on transform, before we move on, let's actually add a script to this. I'm just going to call it lock on, actually lock on transform. And this is just going to be a script that we can use to fetch the lock on transform. There's no logic in here. So delete the start and update functionality, drop in your namespace if you feel inclined uh, as is per tradition. And I'm just gonna make a comment here saying this is just a script used to fetch the lock on transform. So basically we're just going to use a git component in children and we're going to look for the script and then we're going to set the transform to the transform of whatever object this script is on. So let's save that. Let's go back over now to the AI character combat manager. Let's override the awake. And now I'm thinking about it too. You can also do this in the character combat manager instead. So it does it for the player as well. That way, if you change anything on the player prefab, you don't have to manually drop in the lock on transform again. But we're just going to say lock on transform is equal to get component in children lock on transform as in the component script dot transform 
as in the transform of the object that this script rests on. All right, looks good. Let's go back into the project here now, go to our prefab, and I'm gonna remove the AI character combat manager. So why am I doing this? Well, every AI is going to have different attack patterns, different attacks, etc., etc. So we're gonna give each individual AI type its own combat manager. So I'm gonna call this one uh, AI Undead Combat Manager. I'm gonna delete the start and update functionality drop in the namespace as is per tradition. And this is gonna derive not from the character combat manager, but from the AI combat manager. So it inherits from both classes now, not just the one. So what am I gonna do here? Well, let's make a serializable field first for our undead damage colliders. And I have two, so I'm gonna make one for my right hand and one for my left hand. And again, this will be the same logic if using, say, a character with a sword, you would just say uh, right-handed damage collider or just sword damage collider, if that's your only one, whatever you're doing, just make it match up to whatever you have there. So I'll make a header for this. We can call this damage colliders. And now let's make some variables to calculate our damage, and then we're gonna set up some functions to set our attack damage based on the attacks and open and close these damage colliders. So making a header first, damage will make a serializable field uh, of type int. We'll call it base damage. I'm initialize mine to say 25. And then we'll make a serializable float and we can call this uh, attack 01 multiplier. We can say damage modifier actually a bit more specific. Or I'll say like 1.0 for this one, so just regular base damage here. And then we can make a serializable field float because I have two attacks set up in the animator. We can call this attack 02 damage modifier. And I'll say 1.4 for that one because that's like the heavier lunge attack. Okay, so you can alternately to name these like swipe attack damage modifier and then like lunge attack damage modifier, just to, if you prefer naming it the attacks themselves. But since we're using such a simple uh, attack layout, like attacks one through four, for example, I'm just going to use attacks one through four in the naming conventions here. And right now in this example, obviously we only have two attacks, but what I'm saying is if you only have a handful, then using numbers I find is not too confusing. So let's make a public void set attack 01 damage. And what we're gonna do over here is set the right hand damage collider dot physical damage. You can choose whatever damage type you want to the base damage times the attack 01 damage modifier. Do the same thing with the left hand damage collider. It might not be opened in this case, but if it is, you might as well just set all the damage colliders uh, to the respective damage types. And again, this is just one way to do it guys. If you wanna do it a different way, go for it. There's a million ways to do this. I find this way is very simple and straight to the point. So. I'm going to do the same thing with the attack 02, and we're just going to set the attack 02 damage modifier now to the damage of each hand. Uh, then we can go down to another function here and create one and call it public void open right hand damage collider. And simply we just say right hand damage collider dot enable damage collider. Yeah, that's the name of the function. That's on the base class. And then we do the same thing with closing it, which will be disabling it. And then we just do the same thing with the left and right damage collider. So while I finish typing this out, I'm going to talk over this. What are we doing here? Well, at the beginning of each animation, we're gonna place an event to set the animation's damage. So it will be set attack 01 or set attack 02. And then during specific frames, we open the damage colliders and close them like we do for our character. It's very simple. Now, because the animation is played across the network, the animation events will trigger both on the host and client side. So we'll get these damage colliders opening on both the host and the client. And as you saw earlier, we made it so that if we get hit on the client side by the zombie on the client, that's where you take our damage. So let's go in now and drag in our damage colliders inside the damage collider variables here, the left and right hand for me. And then I'm gonna save the prefab. You can see there's no lock on transform variable, that's fine. It should uh, automatically populate when we start the game. Now let's go to our animations and actually set up these animation events. So what do we need to do here? Well, we go down here to the events tab, just like before. And if you have an FBX file, this is much easier. If not, then you can use the anim file and use the window and then use the animation window. But down here in the events tab, we go over here and add an event. I'm going to right at the first frame, set attack 01 damage under attack 01 and apply that. And then we find where we want to open it up here. So right here, that's the left hand. Right there is where I want to open that. So I'm just going to open the damage collider here, paste that. And then right here is just about where I want to close it right when the attack is pretty much done. And then we're just gonna say, paste that again and change that to close, like so. And then do the same thing here for the opposite hand for this animation, because you can see there's there's one hand there and then there's the other hand with this part of the animation. So we're just doing the same thing, but with the other hand now, opening the other hand's damage collider and then closing it. There we go, apply. And again, if you were using a weapon, it will be the same thing. Just open and close the damage collider of the object during specific frames of the attack. Once you get into range enemies, it's a bit different, but we'll cover that much later into the series. Gonna keep it very simple now to get a nice little game loop going. There we go. All right, so 
Again, this is going to have uh, differ heavily based on your enemy types. So just do this depending on how you want the game to feel. Maybe you want the damage clutters to open quicker. Maybe you want them to linger a bit longer. It's entirely up to you. I'm going to copy these animation events now. and I'm going to paste them in the second attack. And we actually don't need the last two here. I'm going to change set attack 01 damage to set attack 02 damage. Apply that. And then I'm going to look for where this opens up. That's right there. Yeah, we'll say it starts right there. Delete these last two animation events. We just need this hand. And then I'd say right there is where about it closes. So yeah, that looks good to me. I'll drag this animation back and click apply. All right, cool. That's looking good. So let's go over now into the undead hand damage clutter. Let's override awake and let's just say undead character equals get component in parent AI character manager. Now I'm going to make this a serializable field variable just in case I want to see it in the future. I probably won't to be honest, but it doesn't need to be public. So let's save that. Let's go back in here now and make sure we disable our damage clutters in our prefab by default. We don't want those enabled until they're enabled via the animation event. Okay, that looks good. Uh, oh, also the damage clutter, let's open that up. We gotta get that on awake. So on awake, uh, you can see in the base class, I don't think it actually calls it. So let's say damage collider is equal to get component collider. And that way, if you have a sphere collider or a capsule collider, it'll just get any collider you have there. All right, let's save that. Now I went into the game and I had an issue here. And if you don't name your animation events the same thing as the function, I had disable my function name and close in the animation name. You're going to get that error. So I'm just going to quickly correct this and change it from disable to close. So it matches my animation event names. Now I will go back in the project and I realize that this is the left hand clearly. And I put the right hand animation events here. So I'm going to quickly fix that real fast and then go back. It's very easy to trip yourself up like that. It's just easy to overlook something when it's like left, right, one or two, especially when we're working for a long time. All directions and numbers start to look the same. So I'm going to place those and correct them. Jump back into the game here now. And let's see if this gentleman attacks us. And he is really close. And he's, he's kind of waiting until he's way too close. So I'm going to adjust the distance he needs to attack on that. So the maximum distance, I'm going to change that to 2.5 on attack uh, 1. And on attack 2, actually, it's a bit more of a lunge. So I'll change that to 3. And a lot of that is just going to be playing around these values, guys, to make it feel nice. So just, you know, adjust as you need. Go over and get his attention again. Let's see if we can get him to attack us. There we go. That's a lot better. So again, no damage is being done. And I'm guessing, yep, I got the wrong hand on this animation event as well. So I'm going to correct that. This is attack 02 for me. I'm going to change right to left because it's definitely the left hand. Apply that. Go back and try it again. All right, let's get his attention again. And there we go. And we're being damaged. Excellent. Cool. So working as intended. But he's not rotating during the attack. You can see it's very easy to dodge him. So if I just wait for him to attack and step out of the way, super easy to get out of the way there. So what we want to do next is allow him to trace us a little bit during the attack. That looks really cool, though, especially with the pivot. It's uh, it's feeling really nice already. So we what we want to do is just allow this guy to trace us for certain frames of the attack. So it's a little bit more difficult to dodge. So we're going to do that right now. Let's go over into the character locomotion manager script. Let's make a new function called enable can rotate, and then we're gonna make one called disable can rotate. And all we're gonna do is toggle the bool uh, for rotating and not rotating. So there's a bool called can rotate, I believe, and that should be here, or oh, I might have put that in the character manager because it was very early into the series. I definitely did. So it's probably on the character dot can, yeah, there it is. Okay, so that's gonna bother me, guys. So I'm gonna change that. You don't have to at all, but I, I think you should put it where it makes the most sense for you. Um, if I go to my character manager here, I have a few flags that should be under character locomotion. So it's grounded, can move, and can rotate. And applied root motion really should be on the animator manager. So I'm going to move those to those respective locations. You don't have to. Uh, this just makes the most sense for me. And I always want it to make the most sense and be as simple as possible. So I'm going to move these over here like that. It's probably going to give us about 20 errors, but they're very simple errors to correct. You just got to call them from the location that they've been moved to instead of where they were before. Super straightforward stuff. So I'm going to move these over here now. I'm going to go to the character animator manager and move this uh, bool over here. And I'm going to make a header for flags because this is the only flag on the character animator manager. I think it will be the only one we ever have. And this is all, again, just preference. If it makes the most sense to you on the character manager, keep it there. Okay, so 25 errors. I'm not going to do all these in the video. I'm just going to show you a couple. Uh, you know how to do this by now. So character.applyRootMotion becomes character.characteranimator.applyRootMotion. Uh, character dot can rotate becomes character dot character locomotion manager dot can rotate, 
And likewise, character.canMove becomes character.characterLocomotionManager.canMove. Uh, we save this and apply remote motion again, same thing. Apply remote motion on the player animator manager is just called locally. And is grounded is called from the locomotion manager. Same thing down here, call from the locomotion manager, save that. And just do the same thing for all your errors. Okay, so the only one that you might be a little bit confused on, uh, probably not, but maybe somebody is right here where the screen line happens. You want to say this dot apply root motion is equal to apply root motion because the variable name in the function is the same as the local variable name. So if you want to change that, go for it. So it's less confusing. Now back to the script. So we have enable can rotate. Let's make a disable can rotate. And we just do the same thing, but we say can rotate is equal to false instead of true. Now we're going to call these two functions under animation events again. Now optionally too, to really simplify it, if you wanted to, you could allow rotation during the uh, open damage collider and closed damage collider events. But I find that for some attacks, the tracking happens way too long in that case. So I want to be able to control manually when I allow the tracking to happen for a really fine tuned experience. So right here, I like this, I'm going to enable can rotate on this frame. And then I'm going to go a little bit ahead and right there, part way through the, uh, the damage clutter being open, I'm going to disable can rotate because that's kind of when his foot stops moving. And I'm just going to not allow rotation anymore on this attack. So if you just dodge the first one, you're good. Now in the second attack, it's a deeper lunge. So this one's gonna track a little bit longer right there where the foot starts moving. I'm gonna enable can rotate. I'll say like a little bit into the momentum of the attack. And then a little bit longer after that, even after the damage collider is closed, I'm gonna disable can rotate. And this is gonna be totally subjective. So it depends on again, how you want the game to feel. It's gonna be more difficult if you track longer and if your rotation speed is faster. So keep that in mind, this is gonna take a lot of tuning. You're probably not gonna get this right the first time. You really want to think of how you want it to feel and capture that. So let's go to the attack state and let's call our rotating logic by saying AI character AI character combat manager rotate towards target whilst attacking. Now we need to do something else too. This is where order of operations matters a lot. So you can see here we're checking for is performing an action if we are returning and we're returning right here, right to the top of this function. We want to keep rotating while we return while we're performing an action. So we need to put this after we rotate. So we're going to come right here after we combo. We're gonna check if we're performing an action so we go back up to the top and we keep rotating while we're attacking. Likewise, if we can perform a combo in the future, we'll go back up and perform that as well. So let's go back into the game now. And as you can see when he attacks me, yes, he rotates as intended and he's tracking me very nicely. So you wanna set this up wherever you want the attacks to track. Keep in mind, the longer the attack can track, the more difficult it will be. All right, guys, so on the next one, we're gonna jump into some sound effects on these characters and then we're gonna actually make a boss and a boss event. And then we're gonna set up a little mock level for our game loop. So as always, thank you very much for joining me. I hope you all have a lovely weekend, and I will see you in the next one. And of course, a special thank you to my patrons. It is because of all of you I get to keep doing this, and I love doing this. So thank you, guys.